Well, you came. I had no idea you would, but thank you for coming, and uh, I look forward to hopefully making you laugh. Uh, don't hold back. I don't want. <laughs> I don't want to be like Jack Benny, who was speaking in Back Bay, Boston. And uh, he kept speaking, and there wasn't a sound in his audience. And uh, he just kept reaching deeper into his joke book to, to talk. And uh, finally, he just gave up and decided to get the heck out of there as soon as possible. And sure enough, uh, a little old lady with a high lace collar came up to him and said, Oh, Mr. Benny, Mr. Benny, you were so humorous. We could hardly keep from laughing. <laughs> well, feel free, my friends. Uh, I am sorry to have to talk sitting down, but actually my left ankle hasn't been the same since I started kicking the wall when Rush Lombo said, Feminazi for the hundredth time. And I've been the same since. Oh, thank you so much. Now, if I want y'all to hear every word, and if you don't put up your hand or shout or walk out or do something so I'll know. I am 86 now, and I, I have to admit I'm an aging artifact who's found that aging is a pleasure if you don't lose your sense of humor or if you don't use your, lose your memory at the same time. <laughs> I don't feel old so long as I can remember, and I still can, when the Dead Sea was only sick. <laughs> now, I don't mind saying right out loud that I am a liberal, psalm-singing, foot-washing Democrat, and that's no longer a lie. That is no longer a laugh line, as we know. Uh, you can say it right out loud. Uh, and there were times in Texas, though, when everyone said that, and it wasn't a laugh line. I think we've returned to such a time now. Anything uh, you do as you grow older, I think, you know, uh, it's a reflection of the things that shaped you in your own personal history. And for me, it was growing up in a big family during the Depression. And incidentally, I hope you agree with me that nobody calls it the Great Depression. They didn't at the time. It's just the historians that came along later. But it did help if you could laugh. And of course, having a laugh along mother got us going, all of us in the family. So we vied for, for laughs. And after graduating, uh, here at the University of Texas in 1942. I went to Washington, uh, as I like to say, with my virtue in hand and, uh, how did I say that? <laughs> I forgot. With my diploma in hand and my virtue intact, you've been there before. Okay. <laughs> and, you know, later, well, Washington and Congress and the White House really were my destiny, and Washington, D.C. was, as it claimed at the time, the only asylum in the world run by its own inmates. <laughs> and I think it's still a good line for it. But I found out that, you know, everybody there is in the public, the political, the whole audience game, and you are expected to be irreverent if you're going to uh, live there. And I think that that's what democracy is all about. We do laugh at ourselves. Uh, somebody once asked Voltaire if he ever used humor in his speech, and he said, no, uh, I just, I never make ha-ha. Well, I think that there isn't any politician who doesn't try to make ha-ha today, and don't, most of them don't make it. But anyway, <laughs> I covered Congress and the White House for about 18 years before LBJ scooped me up. I was a reporter before, and then he scooped me up as his assistant. And so I had begun collecting anecdotes and uh, quotes from presidents 
who use quips for one reason or another. And tonight is a great time for me. Uh, as Betty Sue told you, I have, oh, she didn't tell you. Well, I want to tell you. I have a new book out called, <laughs> with, And I'm proud of the fact that it came out uh, while I was 86. But I pulled together the best lines from presidents and politicos. And I really wrote it with the people in mind, candidates who could steal from it, as I have, and uh, the, uh, their speech writers. But anybody who makes speeches will be improved by reading this book because uh, you can, laughter saves the speaker. Uh, anyway, uh, I, have, uh, I have been covering presidents from what feels like George the First to George the Worst. <laughs> and, <laughs> now, when you get to be 86, you don't hold back. <laughs> but uh, I, I hope you're going to read it and like it and use my book. And as I say, anybody has the license to steal anything in it because it isn't all original. <laughs> but uh, I began, uh, you know, piecing this book together about a year ago when I was starting out uh, 50 years of diaries and documents, which I laughingly call my papers. And I will ultimately give them to this great library of which I'm so proud and I'm so glad I have seen it happen and thrilled to all of the things that have happened here. There was a time long ago, back in the early days, uh, when right here in the Bible Belt, you could run for office on a three-plank platform. And it was paying your honest debts, saving your seed potatoes, and baptism by total immersion. <laughs> but at that time, politics was a gentler profession and had not been invaded with its hired focus groups and its dirty tricks and its political handlers, which I think has muddied up everything. <clears throat> Today, you know, with the mass media feeding us uh, around the clock, and I do watch a lot of television, uh, it's a good thing to do while you're lying down. And it's, uh, and I like to follow the stories that, you know, you've seen happen because when I started being a reporter, we just had radio. And uh, you had one small radio at home and everybody hovered around it. Uh, but uh, today, we have a lot more than that. In fact, news is coming at us from all ways. Um, it's no trouble today to have topical gags. Uh, for instance, Page Voice. Uh, what does GOP stand for? Grand old Page Boys. Or grumpy old perverts. Uh, or gay old pedophiles. I mean, you could go on and on. In fact, I, I found another one here uh, today that uh, oh, yeah. I don't think Foley gets it. Today he apologized and promised to turn over a new page. Well, that's <laughs> so you can, you can really get on the Internet and find almost everything you need. I think it was H.L. Mencken once who said, on some great and glorious day, the plain folks of the land will reach their heart's desire at last, and the White House will be adorned with a downright moron. <laughs> well, uh, we, uh, I won't even comment on that. <laughs> uh, you know, I've been collecting the humor, as I said, since I arrived in Washington during the Roosevelt administration, and that's FDR and Eleanor, not Teddy. And <laughs> at that time, uh, I remember the story was going around that, who was it that came to the White House? Somebody from Georgia who was funny. Who was it? 
Who? No, he wasn't funny. <laughs> it was a it was a a writer, Harry Middleton. Who who was it? Well, I can't remember who it was, but he asked and said, "Where where is the president?" And uh, Mrs. Roosevelt said, "Wherever you hear the laughter." And I think that that you know that is a wonderful thing if you could put it on your tombstone that you were heard wherever this, the, the laughter. But anyway, in my search for humor, uh, I uh, came upon the story uh, of one of the more obscure presidents, uh, Franklin Pierce to be exact, who uh, liked to tell this story about himself. He was virtually the last to know that the Democratic Convention was about to do what the Democratic Convention was about to do to him. And he wasn't even there. He was vacationing in his home state of New Hampshire. And by chance, his manservant, who was down shopping in Concord, uh, heard the news on the street. And he came rushing back and burst in on, on his boss. And he said, oh, Mr. Pierce, Mr. Pierce, ridiculous as it may seem, you've just become, been nominated president of the United States. <laughs> well, you don't get nominations like that anymore. <laughs> uh, I think that, uh, that one of the things that's helpful with my book is you divide up the gags into uh, kind of categories uh, because presidents seem to lean on these categories for humor, retirement, hecklers, revenge, inauguration, and so forth. Uh, president Nixon was really not considered a laugh-along president. <laughs> uh, it's much more uh, connected with the darker side of human nature. But he once told President Kennedy's ghost writer, Ted Sorensen, Ted, I have to admit that I listened to the inaugural address and there were some words that Jack Kennedy said that I wish I'd said. And uh, Ted answered, well, you mean the part about ask not what your country can do for you? No, no, Nixon shot back. I mean the part about I do solemnly swear. <laughs> That's about as funny as, as Nixon ever got. <laughs> But uh, you do need, I think, to be uh, a, a laugh-along speechmaker. You do need an appreciative audience when you're delivering humor. Uh, LBJ once told me, now, because we had some gag lines written for, in one of his speeches, and he said, now get somebody out there in the center of things who knows how to laugh. I don't mean just a smile or a quiet ha-ha. I want a real loud belly laugher like Homer Thornberry. <laughs> so he said, get him up there in the middle of everybody to start the laughter in the audience. Well, I did, and he did, and it worked. And you'll remember uh, that it wasn't long after that that LBJ nominated uh, Homer Thornberry to be a member of the Supreme Court. <laughs> Shows how it pays off. <laughs> Well, anyway, I'm glad that uh, some of the old timers of those wonderful days in the White House, like Harry Middleton and Bob Hardesty, are here tonight because they were trained to laugh out loud. And so I'm hoping that the rest of you can follow suit. Uh, on the subject of LBJ, well, he was always complaining about the pain of handshaking. And, uh, it got laughed for, for that. But uh, he would say, you don't know what suffering is until you have some lady with a great big rough diamond ring just grill it into your finger and squeeze it while she's telling you her troubles. And he would carry on and show us his scars and so forth. <laughs> uh, I liked his humor. Uh, it, when he tried to use Martha's Vineyard jokes, they didn't play, but he told Johnson City stories, and they played much better because they were more part of it. Uh, one of the funniest 
uh, politicians of all times. Well, Hubert Humphrey, who of course never, never became a president, uh, even though he tried to. But he was famous for being a talker. He'd get started and he couldn't stop. And he told me once, when I got home one night after four television programs, I opened the refrigerator door to get something to eat. And when the light went on, I gave a 10 minute speech to a head of lettuce. <laughs> well, <laughs> Humphrey was really so famous for his nonstop speeches that on one occasion, somebody in his audience stood up and said, Senator, if your watch is stopped, there's a calendar behind you. Which <laughs> reminds me to keep an eye on this watch. Uh, when I was going through all of the gags that I had collected, Ronald Reagan, who was uh, uh, the oldest man that ever ran for president, was the funniest of all the Republican presidents. And his age, of course, was a campaign issue. And he could turn it off. I mean, he'd, he would just take the very thing that they were criticizing and uh, deflect it with humor. And he once said, it was easier to run for president when I was a boy. Back then, there were only 13 states. <laughs> <laughs> well, Reagan's opponent, uh, Fritz Mondale, often accused Reagan of being government by amnesia. And so Reagan replied, uh, you know, he took care of that with a gag. He said, I thought that remark about amnesia was uncalled for. I just can't remember who said it. <laughs> <laughs> and on another occasion, Ronald Reagan said, today marks my first State of the Union address to you. President Washington began this tradition in 1790 after reminding the nation that self-government is finally staked upon the experiment entrusted to the hands of the people. And then came his whammy. And he said this in making the State of the Union speech. Uh, for our friends in the press who place a high premium on accuracy, let me say I did not actually hear George Washington <laughs> say that. <laughs> but it is a matter of public record. Well, so much for the charges that Reagan was too old. But he was even funny in his farewell speech, at least it's funny to me, because it was just an admission of the fact. I know I'm not in government anymore. In fact, I'm out of work, said Reagan. <laughs> but um, quite a few of the gags of presidents on how to handle hecklers. And because uh, if you're a public speaker, uh, and uh, likely to have partisan people in the audience, uh, you uh, are bound to get heckled. But the best way to handle it is with humor. And some of the ways they've handled it, some of their retorts have been, you have the makings of a perfect stranger to somebody who would yell from the audience. Or on one occasion, when President Taft was campaigning, somebody threw a cabbage at him. And uh, it rolled right to a stop at Taft's feet. And he looked down and said, well, I see one of my adver adversaries has lost his head. <laughs> it's hard to beat that. One thing you must know, never invite the heckler to the podium because he'll come and he'll take the whole thing away from you. But another way that one uh, thoughtful president handled it when he was heckled was to say, well, I've always loved you too. And he got applause that drowned everybody out. Uh, President Martin Van Buren was really, uh, by reputation, impossible to pin down on any issue at all. And when a disgusted reporter asked uh, him finally, well, if the sun rose in the east, Van Buren replied, I heard it does but as I never get up before daybreak, I can't vouch for it. So it's taking your own uh, ailments and making them acceptable. Uh, uh, the press, uh, the vast media now, it's not just reporters anymore. The first time I went to 
uh, FDR's press conferences, the press stood, the press that sat, and uh, you had a pad and pencil, and there were just about 75 reporters crowded into that room. <laughs> there was just one radio. There wasn't any television. It's hard for my kids to fathom this, but uh, uh, Woodrow Wilson claimed that his critics didn't bother him. That's the way he handled uh, cracks about the press, because the press was the favorite uh, subject for presidents to batter. And Woodrow Wilson claimed his critics didn't bother him. He said, I just love reading fiction. <laughs> well, and of course, Harry Truman liked to taunt reporters. At one press conference, a reporter said, Mr. President, the first thing Mr. Jefferson did was to re release 11 publishers from prison. I don't know whether that's factually correct or not, but that's what he was told. And Truman shot back. Well, I think he made a mistake on that. <laughs> Another president, Chester Arthur, said, if it were not for the reporters, I would tell you the truth. <laughs> <laughs> That's facing up to it, isn't it? <laughs> and then, of course, President Coolidge was a man of few words, yet he's credited with having more questions in circulation than any other president. Uh, Coolidge uh, was amazing uh, because he even liked to to stop other people from talking. He didn't want to talk, but he didn't want anybody else to. And so uh, one of the most famous quotes came when a dinner partner uh, said, oh, Mr. President, my neighbor has bet me that I couldn't make you say more than two words, to which Coolidge replied, you lose. <laughs> <laughs> he would often greet guests who come through a receiving line and pause to say something to him. Uh, uh, one woman came uh, through the line, receiving line, and uh, she introduced herself. I come from Boston. And Coolidge broke right in and said, yes, and you'll never get over it. <laughs> so much for Boston. <laughs> well, how does a candidate handle a lot of the hot topics of today? For instance, same-sex marriages. Well, I like what Kinky Friedman said. As you know, he's running for governor, and he supports gay marriage for homosexuals by saying, why shouldn't they be as miserable as the rest of us? <laughs> <laughs> and on another occasion, he said, what's so new about same-sex marriage? I know a couple who've had the same sex every night for 30 years. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> President Lincoln, who really was the first one to bring uh, humor out of the closet, because while you can find funny quotes here and there from earlier presidents, and President Lincoln was the 14th president, uh, he was willing to, you know, take the humorist of the day and open a meeting, a cabinet meeting with him, um, with a quote from him. And uh, he said, you've heard about the man who was tarred and feathered and carried out of town on a rail. And when he was asked how he liked it, his was, reply was, if it were not for the honor of the thing, I would much rather walk. <laughs> well, and uh, he also was interviewed one time by uh, a Congressman Arnold, and Congressman Arnold said, how can you tell your little jokes uh, when you're reading the, the uh, battle reports from uh, Gettysburg? And uh, he said, were it not for my little jokes, I couldn't bear the burdens of this great office. And I think that's so true, that you've got to have somebody funny around you, and most presidents do have somebody who will help them laugh or write for them, uh, and it's, it, it, it's a great advantage. Um, I, I think that, uh, I, I hope I haven't already told this story, but uh, <laughs> JFK, you know, named his own brother Bobby uh, to be his attorney general, and he was asked, because there was a lot of criticism 
and all the from all the uh, newspaper columnists, he uh, was asked, "Well, why did you name your own brother Bobby?" And he said, with that you know wonderful upturned uh, head that the, uh, that President Kennedy had and the smile, he said, "Well, Bobby wants to be a lawyer." And we thought he ought to have some on-the-job training. <laughs> Unlikely answer, but it worked. Uh, when Bill Clinton was besieged with all the alleged land scandals about Whitewater, and he was getting peppered with questions, uh, he had to go and face the press yet again at a White House radio and TV dinner. And he said, I'm happy to be here. And if you believe that, I've got some land in northwest Arkansas I'd like to, <laughs> like to show you. Uh, he also, of course, got peppered with questions uh, over, uh, uh, over and over about the Monica Lewinsky scandal. And so at that time, he walked in a, on yet another press dinner and said, and how was your week? <laughs> But President Gerald Ford was accused, and I think it was LBJ who accused him of not being able to walk and chew gum at the same time. But he learned to live with it. And so when he went to speak at his old law school, uh, he said, it's a great pleasure and a great honor to be at the Yale Law School's sesquicentennial convocation. And I defy anyone to say that and chew gum at the same time. <laughs> it, it won him lots of friends. And we don't think of George W. Bush as a wit or as a comedian, although he is using, as you'll notice, uh, since his approval ratings have dropped down to the 30s, whether it's 33 or 38, somewhere between there, uh, he uh, is trying to be lighthearted uh, in response to the, uh, the press mostly. And so um, somebody has said to him that he uh, walked with arrogance. And he said, well, some folks look at me and see a certain swagger, which in Texas is just called walking. <laughs> and, and I think he won on that one. And at one of his earlier press conferences, he was asked by a reporter, are you going to have more press conferences? No, he said, you'd run out of questions and I'd run out of answers. <laughs> As he says, he is the decider. But I think it's obvious he's come a long way since he called a New York Times reporter uh, and he didn't know that, that, that his uh, talking machine uh, was uh, still on, uh, he called the Times reporter a major lead, league out asshole. And uh, today he is, spends his time complimenting reporters on their sartorial splendor or uh, buttering them up in any way he can. Well, to vary it with uh, the Christian Republicans uh, who are gutting public schools, you know, I think that Harry Truman put it so well. There's an immense shortage of Christian charity among so-called Christians. That's a line that would be hot right now. Jimmy Carter, of course, was a storyteller in the Southern tradition, but that was long stories. Too long that, uh, for television to want short, quick answers. And the press hadn't been kind to him but he made his final speech at the National Press, Press Club and at, he, and, and at the end of it he said, and now I would like to thank each and every one of you for your help. Turning to his wife, he said, thank you, Rosalind. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to thank each and every one of you for suffering through my recovery from from uh, pneumonia because I can tell that I should not have uh, made this speech tonight. Uh, I want to thank you for being here and laughing and uh, I'll see you later if you still have books that I can sign. I'd be happy to and I'll sit here 
if those of you who got left standing out there would like to bring them up and find me a pen. Thank you so much.